All right, so we spent some time last time talking about straight line motion, and we did a lot of problems that involved graphs and how to interpret the graph of position, how to interpret the graph of velocity. Um, what we're gonna do today is talk about how to interpret those same things, but without having the graph in front of us. And this is gonna be a skill that'll be assessed on the AP exam quite a bit. So I've got a problem here. I've got a position equation that I was given. Uh, the position's given in meters at time t seconds, the equation you can see, and then I'm asked this following questions. When is the particle moving to the left, moving to the right, at rest, accelerating to the right, accelerating to the left, and not accelerating, and then speeding up and slowing down. So we're going to address each of these. So the first part, part A, moving to the left, moving to the right, and at rest. Those will have to do with velocity. So moving to the left is when the velocity is less than zero. Moving right is when it's greater than zero. And not moving, or at rest, is when the velocity equals zero. Now, so what I would like to know is when the velocity is what sign, S-I-G-M. So, the first thing I would need to do to answer this question is find the velocity. And, of course, velocity is the derivative of position. And the derivative of that equation would be this. 3t squared minus 18t plus 15 plus 0. Now, I want to know where this thing is positive, negative, and equal to 0. Now, if I were looking at this as a graph, it'd be an upward-facing parabola, right? So it'd be something like this, if it crossed the x-axis twice. So there'd be a spot where it's above the x-axis, below the x-axis, and at the x-axis. But I don't have access to a graph here. And in some problems where you don't have access to a calculator, the velocity equation may not be an easy thing to visualize the graph of. So when we need to know when the function is positive or negative, we're going to make something called a sign chart or a sign line. Now, a sign chart is essentially a number line. And it's a number line that's going to let us tell when a function is positive or negative. Now, the function we're testing positivity and negativity for right now is velocity. So every time you're using a sign line, you should draw a number line and label it with the function that you're testing. Now, here are the steps for making a sign chart. First of all, we need to know where the, the function could change sign. Basically, that's where it crosses the x-axis or hits the x-axis, or when it's undefined, like there's a discontinuity, it could change sign across that. So the first thing in making a sign chart we're going to do is we're going to find where, in this case, its velocity is equal to zero or undefined. By the way, if you remember, we had a name for those points. We talked about that last point time. A place where velocity is zero, sorry, where derivative is equal to zero or is undefined. That's called a critical point. Sometimes called critical values. So if I look at this velocity equation that I have up here, that's a polynomial, so it's never going to be undefined. So basically what we want to do with that is take it and set it equal to zero. Now I see that I can factor out a 3 here, and then I'll factor, oops, that'd be t minus 6 and t minus 1, I believe, so sorry, t minus 5 and t minus 1. So my two values will be t equals 5 and t equals 1. So what I'm going to do on my sign line is I'm going to take those two numbers and place them on my sign line. Those are the places where the graph of the velocity would cross the x-axis. So now I need to figure out where the graph is above and below. So I'm going to take numbers, I'm going to test numbers in each interval to determine their signs. So an example of that, in the interval where it's less than 1, a number in that interval is 0. If I take 0 and plug it into the velocity equation, I would get 15. That's a positive number. So that means all the numbers in that interval are going to be positive. It's 0 at 1. If I plugged in a number in between 1 and 5, say 2, 
let's see, that would be 12 minus 36 plus 15. That's definitely a negative number. So everything in that interval is negative. It's zero at five. And then number bigger than five would also be a positive number. By the way, you know the thing I drew at the beginning where I had the little parabola that, for this graph? It's basically like that. So you can see the x-intercepts are at one and five. It's above the x-axis when it's less than one and above when it's after five, and it's below between one and five. But just in case I had an equation that was hard to visualize the graph, I'd want to be able to do this sign chart. So what this basically means is my velocity is positive, which means it's moving to the right. When t is less than one, so negative infinity to one. Now you probably would have a problem that says t has to be greater than zero, so it'd be from zero to one in that case. And then from five onward. And it's moving left when t is between one and five. It's at rest when t is one and when t is five. Now, that's a sign chart, basically. You find where the, the function you're trying to determine its sign is positive or negative, sorry, is equal to zero undefined. You put them on a number line, you test the intervals, and you label the signs. So for part B, it's asking where it's accelerating to the right, accelerating to the left, and not accelerating. So we're actually gonna follow the exact same process for B, making a sign line, but this time we're interested in where the acceleration is positive, the acceleration is negative, and where the acceleration is zero. So I find the derivative of a velocity because that's acceleration. That's never undefined. So I find where it equals zero. And that happens at t equals three. I draw a sign line. I label it. On the sign line, I put my critical points, although they're not called critical points because we're dealing with a second derivative. And then I plug in numbers from each of the intervals. So when I plug in zero, I get negative 18. So all these things are negative. When I plug in four, I get something that's positive. So all these are positive. It's zero at three. So then it's accelerating to the right when the time is bigger than three. It's accelerating to the left when the time is less than three. And there's no acceleration when time equals three. Now, with those two pieces of information, we can actually answer part C. C is asking for speeding up and slowing down. And remember, speeding up, acceleration and velocity have the same sign. Slowing down, acceleration and velocity have opposite signs. So what I like to do is I like to make sort of a super line like this. On the top of it, I'm going to put velocity. On the bottom of it, I'm going to put acceleration like this. So you see the white sign line I made, the one for velocity? It had zeros at 1 and 5. And it was positive, negative, positive. And my acceleration, the green line, had a zero at three, a critical point at three, or not a critical point, but you know what I mean. And it was negative and positive. So any of the intervals that you see where the signs are the same, it's speeding up. Any of the intervals you see if the signs are opposite, it's slowing down. So if I wanted to answer this question, I want to write speeding up and slowing down. I'm going to write a t as an element of. And now I'm just going to read this number line from left to right. So when it's less than 1, velocity is positive, acceleration is negative, so it's slowing down. From 1 to 3, they're both negative, so it's speeding up. From 3 to 5, opposite signs, <laughs> so it's slowing down. And bigger than 5, they're both positive, so it's speeding up. 
So when you're trying to figure out whether something's moving to the left, moving to the right, accelerating to the left, accelerating to the right, or speeding up and slowing down, making these sign charts and making appropriate comparisons is the way to go. All right, so we learned last in the previous video that zeros or roots of a polynomial are associated with factors of that polynomial. So we're going to use that information, given zeros or roots, to write the polynomial that matches those. So I have three different problem types here, and they're going to get progressively more complex as we go along. So the first problem is something like what we did with the quadratics. We're given three answers, 5, negative 3, and 1 half. When we did the quadratic stuff, we were given two answers, say 5 and negative 3. And each of those answers was a value of x. If we took each of those little equations and got them all on the same side, then those would be factors of my polynomial. But remember, one of the things we did with like the x minus 1 half, we wanted to keep things pretty and easy to multiply out. So we multiply any things in which we have fractions by a number to get rid of the denominator. That's multiplying by 2, by the way. Just didn't have room to write it on the other side. So my factors of the polynomial will be x minus 5, x plus 3, and 2x minus 1. So I'm going to write those together. And now I'm going to multiply them out. So you multiply from left to right. So I would multiply those two together. Get x squared minus 5x plus 3x, so minus 2x minus 15. And then I would multiply that by 2x minus 1. And I could do that with a box, or I could do that with the rainbow method. But I like the box, so I'm going to use the box. Oops. <laughs> So filling in the box, and then combine my terms, and this would be a polynomial that has these three as its x-intercepts or its roots. So I would encourage you to go to Desmos, graph this thing that we just got, and see that those zeros are indeed 5, negative 3, and 1 half. All right, so we're going to do the second problem now. This one's a little harder because we have an irrational root. We have something that still has the square root in it. So we know that the 2 is going to give me you know, x equals 2, so I have a factor of x minus 2. Now, on this one, I could go through the whole, like, setting x equal to each of those, the 3 plus 4 root 5 divided by 2, or 3 minus 4 root 5 divided by 2, and going through and doing the box method, kind of like we did before. I think it's going to be shorter this time to actually use that quadratic formula method, so I'm going to walk you through that again so you can see what it looked like. So the quadratic formula is negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. And if I compare parts of the problem... The 2a has to equal 2, so that means that a equals 1. The 3 has to equal negative b, so that means my b is negative 3. And then this 4 root 5 came from a 16 times 5 under the square root, and 16 times 5 is 80. So my b squared minus 4ac has to equal 80. I know my a, I know my b, so if I plug those in, I can then solve for C. So the quadratic would be 1x squared minus 3x minus 71 fourths. And that would go with this and that to make the polynomial. Now, keep in mind, this is kind of nasty. It's got that 71 fourths in it. So I could multiply this entire equation by four to make it pretty. It will still have the same roots as the one that I came up with first. So then I can take this and that 
and multiply those together. So when I multiply those together, <laughs> didn't leave myself a lot of room, did I? I get 4x cubed minus 20x squared. Oh, let's see, that's minus 47x plus 142. Sorry, let me write that a little more legibly there. Trying to get myself some room, <laughs> and that equals zero. Now, the third one is an interesting problem. I have negative two thirds, so I know x would equal negative two thirds. I can go ahead and multiply that by three to get rid of the fraction and move it to the other side. So I have a factor of three x plus two. And then I have three plus i, and I have this statement that says I have real coefficients. Okay, anytime you have an imaginary solution, like a complex solution, like three plus i, or if you have irrational ones like we did in the last one, notice how in this second problem, the two solutions came in a pair, what was three plus that square root stuff and three minus that square root stuff. And then the answer we got had no square roots in it. Same thing is gonna happen with complex numbers. If you have a three plus i as a root and you're told that you have real coefficients, then that means three minus i is also a root. So anytime you have real coefficients and a complex solution, it's conjugate. The one you change the middle sign on is also a root. So that means basically that I have x equals 3 plus or minus i. So if I wanted to do the same quadratic formula method I just used on the previous problem, I could write that over 1. Negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. So my 2a is 1, so a is 1 half. My 3 is negative b, so b is negative 3. My square root of b squared minus 4ac, that's i, which is the square root of negative 1. So b squared minus 4ac would equal negative 1. I can plug my a and my b in. I can solve for c. And so my quadratic that would go along with that but I want to make it pretty so this and this are my factors So if I multiply those together, and then combine like terms, this will be the polynomial that has these as roots. Now, on the first problem I told you, you could take this and graph it and get the roots of 5, negative 3, and 1 half. On the second one, you could graph it as well and see that it has a root of 2, and then it will have two decimal roots that each, each equal the approximations of 3 plus 4 square root of 5 all over 2, or 3 minus 4 square root of 5 all over 2. But on this third one, because two of the roots were imaginary, when you graph that, you're only going to see one x-intercept, and that will be negative two-thirds. Because complex zeros, the ones that have imaginary stuff in them, don't show up on a graph.
So we're gonna talk more about this after the break, but I wanted to sort of lay the foundation of where we're going with all this polynomial stuff.